As they leave the optic chiasm, retinal ganglion cell axons enter the optic tracts, synapse mainly on the lateral geniculate body, and travel through the optic radiations to primary visual cortex. Damage to the visual pathway anywhere in this retrochiasmal portion will cause hemianopic defects in both eyes and they will be homonymous, that is, on the same side of visual space in both eyes. When the patient has a complete homonymous hemianopia, as shown here, you cannot tell where the lesion lies within the retrochiasmal visual pathway. It could be almost anywhere. On the other hand, when the homonymous hemianopia is incomplete, you can use the shape of the defects to locate the lesion within the retrochiasmal visual pathway. Here's how. In the optic tract, axons carrying visual signals from corresponding points in the two hemifields do not yet lie adjacent to one another. As a result, a subtotal lesion here will cause an incomplete homonymous hemianopia in which the defects in the visual fields of the two eyes will not resemble each other in size and shape. The term used to describe these non-overlapping defects is incongruous homonymous hemianopia. Why are incomplete homonymous hemianopias of optic tract lesions so incongruous? Because at this stage, the axons from corresponding retinal areas have not yet come to lie adjacent to one another. The optic tract axons terminate in the lateral geniculate bodies, also called the lateral geniculate nuclei. These nuclei lie within the posterior lateral portion of the thalamus. In that way station, axons originating from the two eyes are still segregated. In other words, axons that started in the ipsilateral eye end up in layers 2, 3, and 5. Axons that started in the contralateral eye end up in layers 1, 4, and 6. Damage restricted to the lateral geniculate body is rare. This structure is so small that most inflammatory or mass lesions kill it all together and cause complete homonymous hemianopias. But selective occlusion of one of the two arterial supplies causes strange looking incomplete defects. Anterior choroidal artery occlusion causes an hourglass homonymous hemianopia. Lateral posterior choroidal artery occlusion causes the opposite pattern of homonymous hemianopia. Axons leave the lateral geniculate body in the root of the optic radiations. Inferior axons, carrying visual information from the superior visual field, are stretched around the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. This bundle is called Myers loop. Lesions in the anterior temporal lobe, especially lobectomies for intractable epilepsy, will pick off Myers loop and cause superior visual field defects that have a distinctive wedge shape. One border lies along the vertical meridian in the superior visual field. The other border lies radially. For that reason, they are often called pie-in-the-sky defects. As they head posteriorly, the axons of Myers loop eventually join up with the superior axons exiting from the lateral geniculate body. These optic radiation axons travel along the outer border of the lateral ventricle in the temporal and parietal lobes. As they proceed farther posteriorly, axons that originated in the corresponding retinal points of the two eyes come to lie adjacent to one another. As a result, damage to the posterior portion of the optic radiations causes homonymous defects in the two eyes that resemble each other in size and shape. The term used to describe these defects is congruous homonymous hemianopia. When the optic radiations reach the posterior end of the lateral ventricle, called the atrium, they split into upper and lower forks. The upper fork, carrying visual signals from the lower quadrant of the visual field, enters the superior visual cortex. The lower fork, carrying visual information from the upper quadrant of the visual field, enters the inferior visual cortex. Lesions of the primary visual cortex often selectively involve the upper or lower banks of the primary visual cortex. One border of the visual field will be aligned to the vertical meridian, the other to the horizontal meridian. Such visual field defects are called homonymous quadrantinopias. Damage to the superior primary visual cortex produces inferior homonymous quadrantinopias 
damage to the inferior primary visual cortex produces superior homonymous quadrantinopias. Here is a useful clinical point. Homonymous quadrantinopias are always caused by primary visual cortex lesions. The visual field is represented in primary visual cortex along the calcarine fissure, which extends from the parietal occipital fissure to the tip of the occipital lobe posteriorly. The posterior 50% of the primary visual cortex gathers visual signals from the central 10 degrees of the visual field. This expansive representation of the central visual field in primary visual cortex is called the magnification factor. It underscores the importance of foveal vision in primates. The mid portion of the visual field, extending from 10 degrees to 60 degrees eccentrically, is mapped onto the midsection of primary visual cortex. The peripheral temporal field, which extends from 60 to 90 degrees, is represented in the most anterior portion of the primary visual cortex. When a lesion is restricted to the posterior half of primary visual cortex, the homonymous visual field defects will be limited to the central 5 to 10 degrees of the visual field. Such visual field defects are called homonymous paracentral scotomas. Because these defects actually have a border aligned to the vertical meridian of the visual field, they are called macular splitting defects. They are so small that they will be overlooked on standard static perimetry, but patients are very bothered by them, especially when they are trying to read. The 10-2 protocol on the Humphrey perimeter and equivalent protocols on other visual field testing devices are more successful in finding these defects. When patients try to read, they find that one half of the viewed word is missing, so that reading is effortful. A lesion restricted to the anterior 50% of primary visual cortex will spare the central 5 to 10 degrees of the visual field, a phenomenon called macular sparing. Patients tolerate this visual field loss much better than macular splitting. It allows a more normal reading speed. A lesion that spares the far anterior primary visual cortex will spare the temporal crescent of the visual field in the contralateral eye. This crescent, which covers only 30 degrees, is not matched by the nasal field of the ipsilateral eye, so this defect is purely monocular. Standard automated visual field protocols do not usually test this peripheral portion of the visual field, so this spared portion will be overlooked. Patients may assume that the preserved temporal crescent allows safe driving. Be skeptical. Rarely, a lesion restricted to the far anterior part of primary visual cortex will cause a crescentic defect in the temporal field of the contralateral eye. Caregivers will assume that a retinal lesion is responsible, but will hunt for it in vain. Not finding it, they should at least consider that the lesion might be in the far anterior visual cortex. Vision is not complete when the signal reaches the primary visual cortex. It lacks meaning until the signal is carried to visual association cortex in parietal and temporal lobes, where it is interpreted in the context of space and memory. Vision Pathway Part 6 reviews the occipital parietal segment of this visual perceptual pathway.